When I was a child, I occasionally visit the Funen village. This historical pearl is an open museum where the visitors can walk around and explore how a village looked between the 17th to the 19th century in Denmark. This place is another good reason to venture outside of Copenhagen and see what else Denmark has in store for you to explore. This was how the countryside looked during the lifetime of the famous writer Hans Christian Andersen. While he was born in the city of Odense, he would often travel out of the city and explore the nearby villages. I am certain that it was his curiosity and his lust to travel that gave him the edge in writing interesting stories set in the environment of his time. This quote from Hans Christian Andersen still echoes as true today as it did hundreds of years ago. To move, to breathe, to fly, to float, to gain all while you give, to roam the roads of lands remote, to travel is to live. The video that I want to show you today is one that was recorded by the Funen Village Museum and a video that I have permission to use. I hope you enjoy it. In The Ugly Duckling, Hans Christian Andersen writes, Yes, how lovely it was out in the country. Whether or not it was so lovely out in the country when Andersen was alive, you can get an impression of at the Funen village, which among other things shows the major changes that took place in rural communities in the 19th century. Someone you could meet at the turn of the 19th century in the typical Funen village was Jens Hansen, tenant farmer at Fjelstegorn. Like practically all farms on Funen, it was owned by a squire, and in order to be allowed to use the land and buildings, Jens Hansen had to pay manorial dues, a tax that had been imposed on tenant farmers or copyholders for centuries. But here at the end of the 19th century, Jens Hansen had already experienced considerable changes to his working conditions at Fjelstegorn. Until the village of Fjelster was enclosed in 1785, Jens Hansen's land was spread out in 83 small strips in the common field. In that way, good and bad soil was justly divided between the farmers, although work in the fields meant a great deal of transport from place to place and careful coordination with the other farmers. All important decisions about when plowing, sowing and harvesting were to be done had to be jointly made by the farmers in the village. The common field system did not only apply to cultivation. In the village statutes there were also precise rules about how one was to behave in daily life and on festive occasions. Immediate fines, most often in barrels of beer, were imposed if the rules were infringed. Every Volumissa, 1st of May, all the fences of the rye fields must be completely finished. Every farm will be fined half a firkin of ale if new fencing has not been put up. That was one of the 149 regulations for the village of Oestrup in the 17th and 18th centuries. Up until this point, land was cultivated using the three-course system. The village had three large fields, known as Vanga, which alternatively lay fallow or were used for cultivating barley or rye. So all one had to do was to raise fences. With the introduction of enclosure, the 83 strips of land belonging to Fjelstegor were collected into three large plots. This made work somewhat easier, and Jens Hansen was himself able to decide how and when the land was to be cultivated. He chose to divide the land into seven fields, a crop rotation that gave more reliable and greater yields because various different crops were cultivated. The farmers had to fence in the many new fields. This meant that thousands of ditches and other boundaries came to characterize the landscape. During the 19th century, the number of ditches, fences and stone walls on Funen increased 10 to 20-fold. Marius Dinesen on the neighboring farm bought his land from the manor in 1845 and was thus no longer a copyholder but a freeholder. Marius procured some of the money for purchasing the farm by dividing out some of the land for small-scale farming. It took over a hundred years for all the Funen farms to have become freeholdings. In 1919, the copyhold system was abolished by law and the farms were now able to change hands and develop under normal market conditions. 
Around 1800, 80% of the Funan population lived in the country, and in the course of the 19th century, the farming population more than doubled. The many new country folk needed somewhere to live and live off, and the number of farms increased from approximately 15,000 to 40,000 in just over a century. The main increase was in the number of small holdings. Many of these came into existence when new freeholders sold off minor portions of their farm. The landowners also built many small houses, which they rented out to their farm workers. The new farms and houses were often located on areas of poorer soil or on the fringe of the common field, while the old farms remained in the village itself. The owner farmers became richer, the smallholders and day laborers poorer. 20,000 country folk from Funan emigrated to America. Today, the market still plays a large role in the development of farming. But by contrast with the 19th century, the tendency is for there to be less and bigger farms. The democratic agricultural revolution of the 19th century is devouring its young. Even in the early 19th century, work was strongly influenced by the cycle conception of time of former years. Everything was based on repetition. Life followed a fixed pattern governed by the rhythm of the day cycle, the changing seasons, the climate and the weather. The possibilities of change were not part of life in the country or the way of producing things. Until the mid-19th century, the farm was still mainly a self-sufficient production unit. Practically everything was produced that was needed. Foodstuffs, implements, clothing, clogs, candles, ale and apple juice. The things that were not self-produced could normally be bought from the village craftsmen. Carpenters, wheelwrights, weavers, cobblers, blacksmiths, and coopers. Gardens were important on the self-sufficient farm. Vegetables were grown in the kitchen garden and fruit trees stood in the orchard. Not least important was the hop garden, as hops were also used back then for flavoring when brewing beer. The farm buildings and fields were male domains, while the women ruled in the farmhouse and gardens. The servant girls, however, were responsible for the milking and helped with the harvests. The farmer had farm hands and sometimes day laborers to help on the farm and in the fields. Following the abolishment of the old common field system, the farmers of the 19th century worked energetically on improving their use of the land, which was now cultivated separately with the new field systems and methods of cultivation. New implements made work in the field less strenuous. The lighter swing plow made by the local smith replaced the old-fashioned wheel plow. New harrows, such as the duckfoot harrow, also became widespread, and sewing machines were used instead of the traditional broadcast sewing. Many of the larger farms had a horse walk installed that could operate a threshing machine. The cultivated areas of land increased in size because meadows and commons were taken under the plow. Drainage via ditches or drains, the addition of marl and better fertilizing and seed grain improved production. The number of corn grains harvested for each grain sown rose from three to four in 1800 to 16 in 1900. This impressive fourfold increase marked a huge change from the time when even a minor crop failure could lead to serious scarcities. Grain production increased so much that the old mills were unable to cope with the grinding. So alongside the water mills, many windmills were built. They were of the Dutch type with a revolving cap, not formally seen in Denmark. An average farm around the year 1800 had as livestock a handful of cows and a few pigs, sheep, goats and poultry, and of course, two to six horses. The horses were animals of great value and high status, as they were indispensable as draft animals. In the mid-1870s, many farms expanded their production of dairy products and fatteners for bacon. The commodities were to be exported to England, and the number of animals increased considerably. 
Instead of corn, many feed crops were now also cultivated. To attain a good quality and price for dairy products and meat, the farmers had to collaborate on large-scale farming. In the late 19th century, many dairies and slaughterhouses began as cooperatives, with each farmer investing money in the common venture. Since every farmer gained ownership of his own land, the fixed frameworks of former times no longer applied. Independent initiatives and improvements were possible, and this led to visible changes. In the 19th century, the linear conception of time came into existence. One year was no longer a copy of the previous one. The yield no longer solely depended on nature and the weather. It was possible to be born poor and die rich, or to be born in the country and die in the town. The major process of change was supported by better village schools. Agricultural schools and folk high schools also came into existence, where one could learn new techniques and share experiences. The new generation was no longer solely dependent on the knowledge handed down from father to son. In the course of the 19th century, the peasant of former times became the farmer of the new age. He needed new, larger buildings for livestock, machinery, and to underscore his new won prestige. From the latter half of the 19th century onwards, many new farms were built, with half-timbered farms now being replaced by brick-built ones. The quality of drinking water was terrible. The preferred purification method was a brewing process, which necessitated space for the beer room, where the beer could be made and stored. Adjoining the large baking oven, there was a copper for boiling water. It was used for both brewing beer, slaughtering, and washing clothes. People call this room the scullery, and it can be seen as a symbol of the self-sufficient farm. In the Jutland and Funen area, the baking oven and kitchen fireplace were kept separate. As chimneys were built for the fireplaces in the 17th and 18th centuries, the farmhouses normally had at least two chimneys. In the former times, food was prepared directly in the fireplace. Either a fire bench was used on which pans and clay pots could stand, or a cast iron pot was suspended from a chain over the fire. Preparing food in this way gradually gave way during the 19th century as people began to procure cast iron kitchen ranges. It gave prestige to have a large number of fireplaces, tiled stoves and heated rooms. The more chimneys the farmhouse had, the finer it was. Before the 19th century, there were beds in most of the rooms. People slept both in the living room and the kitchen and in the same room, irrespective of the function one had on the farm. Often, two people slept in the same bed, or half sitting up in alcoves. The alcove and four-poster date from the time when the rooms did not have ceilings. The canopy of the four-poster intercepted the straw, dust and small creatures that fell down from the roof. Farmhands and children normally slept in wall seats. As the highest person in the female hierarchy, the mistress of the house was responsible for both the housekeeping and the training of daughters and servant girls. As far as a daughter was concerned, training began when she was very young. Until confirmed, she was called Little Girl, and she assisted on the farm. After she had acquired sufficient knowledge and experience, she was able to go and work as a big girl. When she married and moved to her husband's farm, she assumed the role of the mistress of the house. When she had grown old, she would live as a pensioner on the farm, whereas poor servants and farm workers were given a small, damp room in the infirmary. That was what care of the elderly consisted of at the time. Everyone in the household contributed to the daily work, and everyone's efforts were necessary for running the farm. People were mainly paid in kind. The form of payment and large amount of shared work meant that there was no direct visible cleft between the farmer's family and those they employed. 
At the beginning of the 19th century, the master and mistress of the self-sufficient farm were leaders among equals. But by the end of the 19th century, they were employers on a commodity-producing farm, with higher status than the group of servants and smallholders. The farmer's family ate separately in the dining room. Class divisions had come to the farm. In the farmhouse, the servants and the farmer's family now had separate bedrooms. The servant girls were given a small room next to the scullery and baking oven, while the farm hands moved out to a small room next to the stable. The farmer's family had their bedrooms and nurseries at one end of the house. As far as the women were concerned, considerable changes to their spheres of activity took place in the 19th century. Many everyday things could now be bought ready-made at the co-op, and this made some of their previous tasks unnecessary. Making textiles and clothes, for example, disappeared. More time was now spent on bringing up children, interior furnishings, and cleaning. The mistress of the farm was on her way to becoming a housewife in the urban, middle-class sense. Her pride was now closely linked to having fine sets of china, newly polished furniture, and embroidered knick-knacks in the fine living room, and flowers and curtains in the windows.